Muy buenas tardes a todos. Good evening to all of you here connected today. We will be beginning this uh, forum in a couple of minutes. Okay, vamos a empezar entonces a los que nos están escuchando. Bienvenidos los 78 que están a bordo. We welcome the 78 people who have already joined us. We will be, be we will be starting at 6:05 to allow more people to come into the online room. Uh, les puedo decir entonces a las personas que van entrando en la parte inferior eh, tenemos una. As you come into the room, you will see a button in the lower portion of your screen. You can select English or Spanish. We will have simultaneous translation all the time. Para todas las personas que están entrando. Again, for all the people who are joining us, we are going to have simultaneous interpretation. You see the button that you can select. So if you uh, set your language in Spanish, you will be listening to the interpretation. Hi, Martha. I'm in the English uh, channel now. We'll start in two minutes. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll get back to you eventually, but you'll be with uh, Adrián. So thanks for being with us. Perfect. Back to Spanish. Okay. Muy bien. Espero me estén escuchando ahí. Me confirmo. I hope that you can hear me. Could you confirm for, for me whether you are all listening? Well, welcome. Welcome, everybody. We have 100 people. We will start our webinar on primary repair with a rich enhanced technique. Muy bien. Eh, espero me estén viendo ahí, eh, todos. I hope that you can all see me. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, webinar, a very special one, of the Colombian Society of Orthopedic Surgery, the Colombian Society of Arthroscopy, and the Ibero-American Society of Football Medicine. We have special guests, uh, Dr. Martha Murray from Boston and Dr. V. Fernando Radici from Santiago. So I will leave you with our president, Dr. Rafael Bisal from the city of Barranquilla, who will be opening our webinar tonight. Well, good afternoon, evening to all of you. My gratitude to all the audience for joining us again in another webinar of the Colombian Society of Orthopedic Surgery and Traumatology, the Colombian Society of Arthroscopic Surgery and Sports Traumatology, wish to welcome you. And for us, it is an honor today to have uh, with us Dr. Martha Murray as a speaker, together with Dr. Fernando Radici, Dr. Jose Ignacio Zapata, and Dr. Gravini, and Dr. Leal, who was the organizer of this webinar and who will be the moderator. So without further ado, let us begin this webinar, which I hope will meet all your expectations. So Carlos, over to you. Now you can hear me. I wish to welcome you again and remind you that the webinar is in both English and Spanish. You have the two channels and you can select the Spanish channel uh, for the translation. So, again, without further ado, we are going to begin our webinar today. 
we are going to have Dr. Fernando Radici first. Uh, he's going to give us a prologue. He comes from Santiago. Then we will hear on primary repair, enhanced, uh, rich enhanced uh, repair. And then we will have a round table discussion with uh, clinical cases uh, um, with Dr. Gravini and Dr. Zapata from institutions that have uh, important experience here in Colombia in that area. I'd now like to introduce my friend, Dr. Fernando Radici. He is uh, the chief of orthopedics at the uh, Los Andes University Clinic in Santiago. So he has had uh, work in uh, soccer, LCA, the use uh, of uh, surgical techniques uh, to spare the biology of the LCA when it uh, is ruptured. His experience and publications in LCA with orthobiologicals, uh, uh, platelet-rich plasma are really a world reference. He uh, works with uh, the national uh, soccer selection, uh, the soccer team. He is a president and former president of ISLAT. So I need to say that it is a pleasure and an honor to have Fernando with us today. It is really a pleasure to hear from him about the current status, uh, the state of the art, what is being done, done now and what is being done in research. So welcome, Fernando, to our society and our webinar. Could you please uh, share your screen and your experience? Well, thank you, Carlos. And I wish to thank the Columbia Society for this invitation in order to give you this prologue about uh, uh, this topic and to introduce uh, the topic that Dr. Murray will be discussing with us. So it's a pleasure to be with you. The idea is to discuss uh, the LCA in the immature skeleton. What are the current uh, situations. As you know, the knee in uh, children who play sports uh, is injured frequently, and this has been increasing because this has been a high demand for sports, uh, great uh, access also to the activity, to sports activity in children and teenagers uh, in schools and in sports clubs. So knee injuries are one of the injuries that are causing headaches for us. However, most of these injuries are injuries, uh, fractures, uh, avulsions of the spine, and, they, and the body injuries were not so frequent previously, but this has increased. It's now 10% of all injuries. So from the point of view of development, we know that this uh, ligament has a constant process, an important process, uh, which uh, starts uh, in fetal life and up to 18 years of age. It's a ligament that is uh, in constant growth and maturation very well supplied through the peritoneal uh, sheath and the terminal elements in tibia and femur. And it has been found also that uh, this ligament grows 2.25 uh, millimeters in length per year up to six years of age, 1.46 millimeters per year between seven and 12 years. Then it reaches a plateau and it remains uh, growing at 0 0.45 millimeter per year up to six, 18 years of age. So this uh, potential, this biological potential of the ligament during this stage of development is very important. And it is a factor that I believe can be very advantageous for the implementation of orthobiological uh, techniques with this ligament and uh, which can also be perhaps used in adults. So when we talk about biological age, it's not only the age in years, but what it means in terms also of development, pre-pubertal and pubertal, we always use standard scale. Uh, here we have a clinical case of the LCA, the youngest child that I have operated, an 11-year-old, uh, high performance uh, child, uh, motocross sustains the right uh, trauma in the right knee. There was an association with um, medial meniscal injury, and uh, he had still uh, two dates to finish his uh, year of competition. So we managed him in orthosis, uh, uh, tailor made. Uh, uh, he was able to uh, complete his 
dates and finish this competition, but when we talk about these ruptures of the LCA in children, we also have to face a dilemma, and it is whether if, if we don't treat this instability specifically, we know that there will be, until growth finishes, uh, there will be damage in cartilage structure and meniscal structure, according to series, they may, may range between 47% uh, and 17% of meniscal damage. And uh, there will also be an altered quality of life. Uh, but if we go to the surgical option, there are also risks because we may alter the growth plate and give rise to iatrogenic deformities that may be much worse than the sensation of instability and meniscal damage that may occur four or five years later. So it is very important to always weigh what to do and how to work on each of the cases. Uh, here we can see cases of up to 20 millimeters of asymmetry in patients under uh, 13 years of age. The important thing is that we learn uh, without Noski that if we violate uh, the growth plate, uh, immediately a bone bridge that altered the normal development was created and created abnormality but it was also determined at the time that if the tunnel that was created through the physis was filled with the soft tissues or tendon there were no alterations in the growth plate so this opened the specific field of doing lca repairs in this way so, options of treatment first, the conservative management uh, through the use of orthosis uh, and continuous education, uh, kines kinesiotherapy, which is very difficult in children under 12. It is easier in uh, children that are getting close to 16 years of age, but it's an option. Second option is surgical treatment uh, where there is there are techniques uh, developed uh, to perform primary repairs uh, using internal braces that have gained popularity uh, in recent years with apparently good results. Uh, anatomical reconstructions uh, can uh, be transepiphyseal or epiphyseal depending on the technique uh, that we are used to using or depending on the child's age uh, and extraarticular reconstructions, which in my opinion are complementary and uh, in factors which are associated factors like hyperlaxity, recurvatum. And if we do the reconstruction associated with this the extraarticular reconstruction, we can add uh, stability and orthobiological management uh, with the preservation of the ligament stump, uh, the use of PRP or platelet-rich plasma, stem cells. I don't have much experience in this specific field of the LCA because there are also papers that have published that it may be an important factor. And new technologies uh, uh, of repair of the ligament, uh, adding some fixation but we'll allow Dr. Martha Murray to tell us about that. Um, and medical treatment, ideally, to avoid surgery in puberal children up until they mature because of the risk of damaging the growth plate. A work published by Madeleine recently uh, with a 36-month follow-up showed with, uh, with a brace, good education and rehabilitation, meniscal lesions may drop by 17% and they may be repaired. And most of the patients uh, complain of joint instability in up to 37% of cases. However, there are other series that show that meniscal lesion occurs in up to 50% between 6 and 12 months. Uh, changing the prognosis. Uh, surgical treatment, uh, primary repairs like the transient internal brace uh, uh, advocated by Smith. The, this brace keeps the knee protected and after three months it is removed. And uh, you can see under arthroscopy that the healing of the LCA really happens and biomechanically it is functional. You and so there are expectations in that regard. From the point of view of the usual surgical treatment, the transepiphyseal and epiphyseal techniques that are available, they all show good results from the point of view of reconstruction and return to sports activity and 
quality of life is regained there are series that show 2.6% of angular deformities, which is very low, regardless of whether they are trans epiphyseal or epiphyseal, but with the biggest incidence of complications in particular of uh, angular deformities is one uh, when epiphyseal techniques are used. The re-rupture has a higher incidence than in adults. In our series, it is much higher, and we're going to show it later. And this reconstruction uh, is proposed in this type of work when we find uh, these uh, factors, hyperlaxity, recurvatum, and uh, augmented tibial. If we are, uh, are afraid about the physis as a factor, it has been shown that in order to damage, there needs to be more than three to 4% of the total area of the physis compromised. Then any reconstruction technique, transfacial reconstruction damages less than 3% of the facial area unless you did a very oblique and very large tunnel. And all the series published in this regard show that the facial damage is very low. However, it has been shown that tension uh, to which we can fix the graft when we do the reconstruction may be a far more important factor than the damage on the growth plate. The tension of 80 newtons has shown to produce, at least in animals, uh, alterations in the facial closure or abnormal growth. And this may create true and significant deformities. And it is what has been seen and published in recent times in um, where there are deformities without having violated the growth plate at any time, uh, maintaining that uh, tension could cause that deformity. Tibial physis is more vulnerable than the femoral one, and that is why it is advised to perform the tunnel as perpendicular as possible. In our cases, we have 95 patients uh, divided into two groups between 11 and 13 years, which is a high risk group for us for treatment. And the second group between 14 and 16 that behave more than, as young adults than children and uh, divided according to their sports uh, between men uh, or girls and boys uh, in uh, men, uh, rugby and soccer are the most uh, frequent uh, fixation. We use this transfix uh, initially always sparing the physis uh, with no uh, fixation in the physis. And then we went to the endo button, the retractile type. Uh, on follow-up uh, in of our 95 cases with a median of 11 years, this is what is most striking revisions, 10% uh, in children under 13 years of age and 14% between 14 and 16, a very high rate of re-rupture in LCA as compared with uh, older adults. There are no problems with the growth plate closures, tunnels between uh, six to seven millimeters and return to sport is low as compared to what we will see later in older adults, uh, uh, which is only 70 to and 80%. So with these raw statistics, we see that even though we solve the quality of life for the children, we are far from achieving the best results or the same results in terms of reconstruction and return to sports that we see in young adults. And adults, these are the follow-up x-rays to measure symmetry. And one of the things that we saw during follow-up is that the tunnels grew um, specifically together with uh, the child's growth, uh, say six, seven centimeters uh, uh, longer than originally it elongated actually. From the point of view of orthobiological management, uh, we have preservation of the ligament, the uh, PRP stem cells and new technologies. And we were able to show if uh, following uh, the maturation of the graft uh, with biopsies at different months, uh, comparing with imaging, of MRI imaging, we saw a correlation of the level of graft maturation with the histology based on this study. And we were able to see that we, if we applied uh, PRP at the time of surgery and in high performance athletes uh, uh, later, a dual dose, therefore, then there was a shortening of the maturation process of the graft, 49.4% uh, uh, shorter. Instead of having to wait eight or nine months, we would see the same radiological changes on the MRI after 4.5 months. And therefore we did shorten the time period. However, at present, there is a high, there's a big discussion on whether, whether 
on whether the application of PRP works in this type of surgery. And I would say that there is a 60% of authors that are more in favor of saying that the usefulness of PRP in LCA reconstruction is rather nil or useless versus 40% who have shown in different ways that it could be a biological factor that could stimulate and improve the quality of the graft. It is still a work in process to try to test histologically what is happening. So as I say, this is still work in progress. And what is uh, stump preservation from the biological standpoint. It has uh, given us better results in recent years with children because we can release uh, the stump, which is quite large, normally in these types of ruptures, we can prepare it always. Uh, and you can see on the video with RF how the scars uh, and the adhesions to the uh, posterior cruciate ligament. So what we do is uh, with the jig, we uh, uh, ream up to the edge of the physis and we can use a smaller burr, a drill, a smaller drill of five millimeters, uh, and we can play with the needle. And uh, um, when we can uh, thread the stump in the center and use it as a tube as it was enveloped all around and through the center of the stump we will pass the graft and with the shaver we open up a sufficient space to achieve this and as you can see we pass the uh, traction guide we always use uh, hamstrings uh, and we uh, pull through it. Uh, we pull the graft that goes then into the center and you can see that anatomically surrounded by the original ACL and this uh, will give it uh, biomechanical properties, uh, blood supply, which are quite good. And you can see here the uh, original stump, uh, which comes to the edge, no impingement is caused with good tension. So we mix the fixation and we, with the biological preservation of the original ligament, and this is very reproducible and all stumps can work and it is rare not to have a stump in an acute injury. Therefore, as final considerations and waiting for Dr. Murray's lecture, we see that ACL injuries in children is increasingly frequent. It has been shown that the surgery has increased by three times in recent years, that the course is not the same as in adults. There's a high incidence of re-ruptures that we have not been able to manage appropriately, appropriately yet. We have a higher level of complications, in particular in younger patients. So we consider uh, early surgery or wait a couple of years on the finding orthobiological treatments to repair the ACL without perforating the growth plate and uh, reducing complications caused by surgery is what is the future and even the present. And Dr. Martha Murray, who has been working in this uh, structure of creating a uh, bridge enhanced uh, reconstruction opens a great window to develop this type of surgery in uh, cases that are very uh, in, in small children with open growth plates uh, who could have a repair with uh, new options. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando. It is uh, exactly what happens uh, to all of us. It is uh, the uh, hot topic, really, what to do with the myth of this repair, in particular in pediatric patients. As you show, clearly this continues to be a challenge and we have an increasing number of patients. So we are going to leave the questions for the end. I'd like to remind you all that we have the chat where you can ask questions and there's also a time for questions and answers. 
we are going to organize the questions to have a nice discussion at the end. So yes, Fernando, thank you very much. Now we will continue in our webinar with uh, Martha. Basicamente, uh, well, basically, I'm going to make a presentation with her own videos. These are Martha's videos where she shows uh, the development the, of this uh, paradigm uh, to determine whether this paradigm of the ACL doesn't heal as we see and to have always a surgical option, the option of uh, now, if the ACL never, if it never heals, should we have to exchange it for a new one? Whether this is true or not, we have all tried to look for solutions and it hasn't been easy. The answer is, well, this answer is, which is, take, which is to take uh, to surgery. Research uh, in pediatric population uh, offers uh, big difficulties. Um, uh, sometimes uh, it's not easy to bring them back to recovery. It's not easy. There's a high incidence of re-rupture. Return to sports is difficult in this population. And these are children that have an important future and they need to recover. But there are people, people like Martha Murray, who has started to work asking those questions and doing paradigm shifts, working in the area of the reconstruction of the ACL and looking for answers in the laboratory as well as in animal studies and then in human studies. And that courage of carrying out a research project to look into the biochemistry in the biomechanics and not only just the biology, it's the courage that brings her to the people to discuss with them and uh, being able to get to this point, bridge enhanced repairs uh, and to achieve a primary repair of an ACL, uh, which uh, may be an answer. <laughs> we are traumatologists who usually replace the ligaments. Uh, we need to become uh, convinced. Well, um, clinical measurements uh, and uh, work with sports medicine specialist uh, assessing the MRIs, the doing all these things with the, the absolute reassurance for the other orthopedic surgeons of this being scientific work. And even if we are incredulous uh, and we, we ask, is this stable, is this not? She does too. And look at her face of amazement. It appears to work. A ligament is developing, there seems to be a response, and we are amazed as she is amazed. It may be an interesting response, a response that begins to be a solution for sports medicine in adults, and it's a window that we need to look at. So we wish to thank Martha for joining us today. Dr. Martha Murray is a professor of orthopedic surgery of the Children's Hospital in Boston. She is a full-time professor in the Department of Sports medicine and the group of orthopedics and traumatology in Harvard Medical School. She is an orthopedic surgeon from the orthopedic program in Harvard. She is a fellow in traumatology in Brigham and Women, and she did a fellowship in pediatric sports medicine and adult sports medicine, and she did that in the Children's Hospital. But perhaps what I like the most and it's most striking about Dr. Martha Murray is her teamwork. Those of you who have read her previous know that she has a, almost a page and a half of gratitude for her work. And uh, this is uh, what uh, she has uh, 20 years of research and development technologies of tissue regeneration for the repair of the ACL. More than 100 peer reviewed articles in the best journals, laboratory studies, human studies, and the ability to have a team uh, to work with in Boston, which she has been the leader of. So it is a pleasure for us to welcome Martha today, say welcome to our Orthopedic uh, Society of Colombia, the Spanish American uh, Society of Soccer Medicine. So I'd like to extend a most cordial welcome and leave you with your audience. Welcome, uh, Martha, and please uh, share your screen and share your experience for us. 
Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. I'm greatly appreciative of this. Um, and one second, let me just modify. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, so we today, can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. Yeah, I'll be here in my English channel for just anything you need. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. So today I'd like to talk to you about a technique of ACL surgery called Bridge Enhanced ACL Repair, which we also refer to by the acronym BEAR. And I want to take you through a little bit about the concept um, and then through how we got to clinical trials of this technique. I'd like to start with my disclosures. The most important ones here are in red. So I'm actually the founder of a small company called Miyak Orthopedics. And I'm also an inventor on patents owned by my hospital around this technology. So ACL repair has had some struggles. So the problems with ACL repair have really been its reliability. So we know that when we do an ACL re reconstruction, the risk of a failure within the first two years in adults is around 5%. But in adolescence, it's higher and around 20%, similar to what we just heard in Dr. Radici's lecture. However, for ACL repair, the risk of another tear in adults is reported to be around 15%. And even with modern techniques, the recent data suggests that in adolescents who are very active, the retear rate after a primary ACL repair may be as high as 50%. So that is why we now don't really do primary repair. We instead do an ACL reconstruction. But we wanted to answer the question about why isn't ACL healing reliable with repair? And one of the things that we think about is that when we do a primary repair of the ACL, we typically do it in flexion. So the knee is bent, so we have good access to the notch. And then what we do at the conclusion of the operation is we straighten the knee. Now we know that the distance between the femoral and tibial insertion sites of the ACL is shorter when the knee is in flexion. And so if we fix things in flexion and then extend the knee, we may be introducing a gap between the torn ends of the ligament. Now this is a problem in the ACL because while gaps can heal in other tissues, like the medial collateral ligament, as shown here in slides taken from an animal's knee, where we made a slit in the MCL and then a slit in the ACL and went back to see what happened in a week, we see that in the MCL, the defect has been filled in with healing tissue, whereas in the ACL, the defect has remained open. This is because gaps cannot fill in the joint fluid. So we think that the reason that ACL repair is not reliable is because we fix it in flexion, we extend the knee, and in many cases introduce a gap, and that gap cannot fill. And therefore, we are reliant only on the sutures that we have placed to hold the ligament together. And after multiple cycles of fatigue, these will eventually fail, as will the repair. So our thinking was that if that is the problem, can we make ACL healing more reliable by introducing a scaffold or an implant between the torn ends of the ligament and then filling that gap? If we can do that, then perhaps we could heal the ACL. But for us, the question then remains, how do we test this before we go to patients? And so with the help of Dr. Braden Fleming, we worked to develop an animal model where we could study repair of the ACL and begin to understand what type of an implant could be placed in between the ends to stimulate healing. We selected the porcine or pig model for these studies because it had relevant size and anatomy to the human knee. It had relevant hematology, so the blood in pigs and in people, and it had relevant biomechanics. And in that model, we were able to prove that an untreated ACL transection, if we just cut the ACL in the middle, does not heal. We are also able to show that if we do a simple suture repair of a, of a transected or a cut ligament, that it does not do as well as an ACL reconstruction. And we were also able to show that an untreated ACL transection leads to post-traumatic osteoarthritis in the same pattern 
that an ACL, that same pattern is seen in human patients. So with that model, we embarked on bare implant development studies, trying to understand what would work best with the biology of that gap between the torn and ligament ends to enable them to heal. And if we were going to encourage healing in the gap, that not only required scientific testing, but it required other testing specifically for that use as mandated by our US Food and Drug Administration. The requirements that we wanted for the implant were we wanted to have an implant that would allow for cell migration to crawl into it. So we specifically did not want a tissue that normally behaved as a barrier. We wanted something that had an optimized resorption profile in vivo. So we wanted the tissue, the cells, to be able to crawl into the implant and remodel it and for it to then resorb, but not before the cells have been able to establish healing tissue in that area. We wanted to minimize the immunogenic reaction. So we wanted to use an implant that would not cause a significant immune response and a red swollen knee that could possibly look like an infection. And we wanted, most importantly, to end up with good strength of that healed ligament. So we tailored the components of the implant, as well as the manufacturing process, over a period of several years until we developed an implant that met these criteria. So the bare implant, seen here in the picture where I'm holding it, has low immunogenicity. So we've removed the cellular material. This is made from a bovine tissue. So we've worked to remove the cellular material during the manufacturing process. And we've avoided the use of chemical cross-linking agents, which can also cause synovitis. We made it so that it could absorb blood, so it is hydrophilic. And it also contains some collagen, which can help to physiologically activate platelets, which are major factors in wound healing. We also put additional proteins in it that allowed for cell ingrowth of the ACL cells. And we made it porous to facilitate migration of those cells through the implant. So this is just a simple video showing uh, um, our, an artist's rendition of how we think the bare implant works. So this is a knee, and right now they're going to simulate the ACL tearing. So you can see the blood goes into the knee joint. What we do for a repair then, for a bridge enhanced repair, is we put sutures in that tibial stump and pass them through a small femoral tunnel. We also put a suture cinch across the knee to help for early stabilization of the joint. While the patient is asleep, the anesthesiologist can draw blood from the arm, which can be added to the scaffold that is placed in the notch. Once the scaffold is loaded with the blood, the, stump, the, the stitches placed previously in that tibial stump are used to pull the stump up into the scaffold to allow for healing in that gap. So this is another drawing of that same idea where we place the implant, load it with blood, and then, confer, then finish the suture repair. When we do this operation in preclinical animal models, here is what we find. So these are all pictures of a pig knee looking at it from the front. You can see in the left-hand panel, this is an intact pig ACL going from the femoral notch down to the tibia. In the middle panel, you can see what happens if we perform an ACL transection and then do a primary repair alone and then look at the tissue three months later. At this point, the stitches have broken and the repair has failed and there is no tissue left in the notch other than the PCL. In the right-hand panel, however, when we do a suture repair and we place the implant loaded with blood in the middle of the defect between the torn ends, we are able to reestablish continuity of the ligament. When we look at the histology of the repair tissue, we see that by approximately six months after surgery, the histology of the ACL has largely returned to the normal structure we would anticipate. So a few fibroblasts mostly are elongated and there is good waviness or crimp of the collagen material. We also looked at the repair strength of the healed ACL and found that we had equivalent strength of the healed ACL to an ACL reconstruction at three months and then at one year after surgery. So in this large animal model, we were able to find that we could, we could restore the ligament histology, that when we did an implant-enhanced ACL repair, 
the strength was better than when we did a suture repair alone. And it was also equivalent to that seen with an ACL graft in that model. But what about the cartilage surfaces? We take care of teenagers with ACL tears. And so we were very concerned about early arthritis for these patients. When we did in the pig model an ACL transection, what we found was that there was significant loss of the articular cartilage, particularly in the medial compartment, as shown here with the red arrow. When we did an ACL reconstruction, we saw similar loss, again, predominantly involving the medial compartment, as shown here. However, when we did a bridge-enhanced ACL repair, we did not see the cartilage damage or loss. So we did not see the osteoarthritis that was seen at one year in the pig model with the other treatments. So with that data in hand, we went to our regulatory body, which is the US Food and Drug Administration, and we worked with them over a period of years to complete the safety testing and biocompatibility testing required to allow for a first in human study. We were able to start that study in February of 2015. So we call this the BEAR-1 study. This study was led by Dr. Lyle McKaylee, who was my boss. So as I noted at the beginning of my presentation, I had conflict of interest uh, with this technology. So I accused myself from being a surgeon on the trial and acted as the FDA sponsor, so communicating with the FDA while Dr. McKaylee led the study. This was a cohort study. 10 patients had bridge enhanced ACL repair and 10 patients had an ACL reconstruction with autograft hamstring. The inclusion criteria for this study were they had to have a complete mid-substance ACL tear, ages 18 to 35 years of age. We wanted them to be less than 30 days between injury and surgery for the bare patients, and we included all meniscus injuries except bucket handle tears of the medial meniscus. Even though this was a controlled cohort study, the patients ended up being very similar in both groups in terms of age, BMI, mechanism of injury, and stump length. And these were reasonably active patients with an average mark score of 12 points on a scale of 0 to 16. These are the preoperative MRIs for the 10 there patients, showing these all were mid-substance ACL injuries. This is our first bridge-enhanced ACL repair patient. So you can see here the arrow is pointing to the location of his injury. In the next slide, this picture will move up to the left-hand top corner and we will look at what happened in the post-operative cases. So here we have his pre-op, again, in the upper left corner, and then this was his MRI at three months out from surgery. You can see that there is gray tissue bridging from the femoral attachment to the tibial insertion with some early organization of fibers with darker signal in the middle, but predominantly gray still at three months. By six months, the area of collagen organization has, has largened, and by 12 months, the ACL is looking reasonably normal. By 24 months, it stays that way. And at the two-year time point, this patient had a one millimeter side-to-side -side difference in their instrumented AP laxity. The results for the 20 patients in this study show that no patient in either group required revision ACL surgery at the two-year time point. There were no infections or rejections in either group. There was a 20% incidence of additional knee surgery required for both groups. One patient in each group required additional meniscectomy, and one patient in the bear group required the tibial button to be removed because it was painful, and one patient in the ACL reconstruction group required arthroscopy for stiffness and arthrofibrosis. How about patient reported outcomes for this study? No statistics were run on any of the data I'm going to present in this study because it was only 10 patients in each group, but I will show you the means for the different values. So for IKBC scores, the age match norms for this particular patient reported outcome is 88 points. In an ACL reconstruction arm, the average was 85 points, while in the bare arm, it was 92 points. How about instrumented laxity? So we know that uninjured patients typically have instrumented AP laxity difference between the size of less than one millimeter. And in other trials of ACL reconstruction, the difference between the size has been previously reported to be between one and three millimeters. In the FAIR-1 trial, 
the ACL reconstructed patients had a mean side to side difference of 3.3 millimeters, and the bare patients had a mean side to side difference of 1.9 millimeters. In terms of strength, as these were all autographed hamstring uh, reconstruction, it was not surprising that when we tested hamstring strength with the knee inflection, the ACL reconstruction group had a continuing deficit persistent out to two years postoperatively. And because the Bayer group did not require a graft, it is also not surprising that the ACL repair group did not lose hamstring strength. We also performed MRIs on all of the patients in this study. And when we looked at the sagittal orientation of the native ACL, yes, the average orientation was 49.5 degrees. Our reconstructions, which were done with a transtibial technique, averaged 56 millimeters, or sorry, 56 degrees in the sagittal plane. And the bare patients, which healed from tibial to femoral insertion, came in at 49.8 degrees. This is important as the preclinical models have previously demonstrated that the closer we can get the ACL to its native size and alignment, the less osteoarthritis we should expect. So in summary, the results of the BEAR-1 study were that we had no infection, rejection, or failure, no gap formation in the BEAR subjects. The BEAR subjects at two years had good patient reported outcomes, good knee stability, better hamstring strength, and a restored ACL anatomy. But what about our adolescent patients? At Boston Children's, these are really the patients we take care of, and they are at high risk for graft failure, high risk for post-traumatic osteoarthritis. And we wanted to know if this technique could be used to help them. So we know that adolescents have a high risk of graft failure, reported to be usually between 15 and 20% for the high school athlete in the United States. And they also have a high risk of post-traumatic arthritis. Some studies have reported risks higher than 75% at only 14 years out from surgery. So for my 14-year-old girls who have an ACL tear, that means they have a reasonably high risk of developing arthritis in their early 30s. So we started the BEAR-2 trial, which was focused on the adolescent athletes. Our PI was Dr. Yen for this. This was conducted as a double-blind, randomized control trial with three surgeons from our department, Dr. Yen, Dr. McKaylee, and Dr. Dennis Kramer. We enrolled 100 patients. We enrolled them in a two to one ratio. So there were 65 bare subjects and 35 ACL reconstruction subjects. This was done so that if there were small incidences of bad things happening or adverse events at a low rate, we would have a greater chance to capture them for the bare patients, where this is a new procedure. The age limit was dropped down to a minimum age of 14 years again extending to 35 years, and the patients needed to have surgery within six weeks of their injury. We opened the trial in May of 2016, completed enrollment a year later, and were able to obtain two-year follow-up on 99% of the patients. The primary outcome measures for this, this uh, study were we wanted to demonstrate that the bear procedure would be non-inferior, so not significantly worse than ACL reconstruction with an autograph both in terms of patient-reported outcomes and AP laxity of the knee, as measured with an instrumented device. We also looked at secondary outcomes, including hamstring strength, safety, so including rates of infection, loss of range of motion, deep venous thrombosis, and failure. And we're planning to look at the development of osteoarthritis at the six and 10 year time point, but we do not have data on that yet. In terms of demographics, the two groups were very similar in terms of the patients that uh, were in this trial, which is not surprising as a randomized control trial. Please note that the median age in this study was 17 years of age, and the median marked activity score was 16 in both groups on an activity score where 16 is the maximum and corresponds to playing cutting and pivoting sports three or more times a week. The results of the BEAR2 study so that in terms of safety, we had no infections, no significant immune reactions or rejection, and no bare implants needed to be removed. In terms of patient reported outcomes at two years, the IKDC subjective score in the ACL reconstruction group, again, came in at a mean of 85 points at the two-year post-op time point. 
and the bear subject came in at 89 points with the mean and passed non-inferiority by the criteria set prior to the start of the trial. For instrumented AP laxity testing with the KT-1000 device, the AP knee laxity in the ACL reconstructed arm had a mean of 1.8 millimeters, and in the bare arm, it was 1.6 millimeters. And again, the bears group met the non-inferiority criteria that were pre-specified for the trial. Strength measures, again, not surprisingly, the ACL reconstruction group, which in this study was largely hamstring-based, uh, had a persistent deficit when the knee was tested in flexion. And the bridge-enhanced ACL repair patients did not have a hamstring deficit at the two-year time point. What about recare rates? So we know that ACL recare rates in adolescents are high. We talked earlier that future repair without an implant in teenagers leads to a failure rate of about 50%. And even with autographed ACL reconstruction, we are still struggling with failure rates between 15 and 20% reported at the two-year time point in large studies. In our study, the ACL reconstruction group had a failure rate, a recare rate of 6%, whereas BEAR was 14% which came in at similar to historical rates for ACL reconstruction in this patient age group and was not statistically significantly different than the ACL reconstruction group in their group. But we thought, can we reduce the risk of re-injury in adolescents? We currently base our return to play criteria on the strength of the knee and how the patients feel and perhaps how they perform on hop testing. But we wondered if we could possibly develop some way to tell when the ACL is healed enough, something the way, like we do an X-ray of a fracture. So we have been working with Braden Fleming and his group down at Rhode Island Hospital on preclinical development of an MRI as a measure of either the ACL or graft strength. And we found that we may be able to identify patients who are at risk for failure, although more work is certainly needed in this area. But we're hoping that this technique will help us to identify patients who might uh, benefit from a delay in return to sport versus those that have healed to an extent to allow return to sport with safety. We have found that factors that influence ACL healing include patients that are male and have an older age and a longer femoral stump. Those patients will end up with a larger volume and cross-sectional area of the repaired ACL. We also found in the bare tooth study though that even for patients with a small notch, Performing a notch plasty would allow them to also heal in with a larger ACL. In terms of tissue quality, the things that influenced tissue quality in this study were a smaller posterior tibial slope led to better tissue quality and a greater side-to-side -side difference, so more weakness in the operated leg at three months in surgery also led to better tissue quality on the six-month MRI. How about... Uh, how about what happened to the patients who had a re-tear after their bear and then underwent ACL reconstruction? We know that a revision ACL reconstruction can be expected to have a worse outcome than a primary ACL reconstruction. How about a repair then followed by an ACL reconstruction? When we looked at the IKBC scores, so the patient reported outcome for a bear patient who was then had an ACL reconstruction during the two-year follow-up period, we found that the mean for those patients was 85 points, which was similar to that which we saw in the patients who had a primary ACL reconstruction. When we looked at the AP laxity for patients who had a bare repair followed by an ACL reconstruction, we also found here that the side-to-side -side difference in AP laxity for those patients was similar to that seen in the primary ACL reconstruction. So the bare 2 randomized control trial results showed that we had no evidence of infection, rejection, or immune reaction for the bare implant. And at two years, the bare subjects had comparable patient-reported outcomes, comparable knee stability, improved muscle strength, a re-injury rate similar to that seen in ACL reconstruction, but that we may need to look at the rehabilitation more carefully. So in terms of bare, where are we now? We feel that the safety profile for bare is acceptable, the early efficacy studies as shown here appear reasonable, but there is significant work still to be done. I am sure that many of you can think of ways that we could study this and additionally improve the outcome, both in terms of surgical technique and even the rehabilitation protocol. But perhaps someday 
we will be able to repair and regenerate the torn ACL instead of replacing it. I'd like to thank our preclinical team. You can see many of the members here that have helped out with this over the last 20 years, as well as our clinical team. Those of you who run large clinical trials know how challenging this is and how it cannot be done without an excellent team. I'd also like to thank Dr. Leal and Dr. Gravini for the invitation to come speak to you tonight and to Adriana de Hassan for the excellent translation. I'd like to also acknowledge our financial support, which has been largely through the NIH, our National Institutes of Health, and NIAM through grant programs for the preclinical work. And then these early clinical trials were financed by the National Football League Players Association, who have been extremely useful to us, as well as different departments within our hospital and the Rhode Island Hospital Orthopedic Foundation as well. I'd also like to thank our team, our research team, primary research team, including Braden Fleming, who's my co-PI on many of these studies, and then the people that you see here, which are our core team. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Muchas gracias, Martha. Es, uh, thank you verdad. very much, Martha. It is really a pleasure to uh, hear all this uh, that you have to tell us about uh, the research. Uh, there are many questions uh, uh, about uh, paradigms of the past. Uh, and looking at the development of research has been very interesting. I'd like to invite uh, Giovanni, who wants uh, to uh, uh, start then with the question and answer session. Giovanni, you have your microphone and your screen. Thank you, Dr. Morai. Thank you for having shared all your experience. It has been really fascinating to recognize your journey from the laboratory through to the clinical results, uh, starting with mechanical studies, animal studies, uh, until you have come to this point where you have RCTs with this recent publication regarding the results of bear as compared to ACL reconstruction. But in that development, you have also uh, have uh, had many interesting publications uh, and many questions will come up. I have uh, Dr. Radici, Dr. Zapata, also um, to whom we are also going to address questions. It is clear that anatomical factors influence the decision of operating through reconstruction or repair with bridge enhancement as you've been doing. And you have some work uh, done with Dr. Fleming showing that the volume of the notch of less than 0.5 cubic centimeters increased the incidence of injury of the ACL and had no relationship with the weight or of the patient. Based on what you have shown us, would you change the indication for a biological repair as you've been doing as compared to a reconstruction depending on the patient's notch? I would also like to hear Dr. Zapata and Dr. Radishi discuss this point. Yes, so for a bridge-enhanced repair, what we have found is that the and the size of the ACL that you end up with once it heals is dependent on the size of the notch they leave the operating room with, not the size of the notch they go in with. So I would suggest in patients that are having a bridge enhanced ACL repair that have a narrow notch, that a notch class be performed to allow for greater healing and greater cross-sectional area of that healed ACL. That is what we are working with right now, and hopefully that will improve results for those patients. Dr. Zapata, Dr. Radici. Dr. Zapata, Dr. Radici, do you do notch plasty and do you take into consideration the size of the notch to determine what kind of technique you do, transepiphyseal, uh, extraarticular? Who wants to talk first? Dr. Zapata, thank you. Dr. Murray, excellent lecture. We are so pleased to hear you, to see you. We've been following you closely for many years in your publications. We are very much aligned in terms of the Boston Children's concepts regarding ACL surgery in children and adolescents. Regarding the questions, I agree with Dr. Martha in the sense of doing a notch plasty when it is small. I usually do it, particularly in younger patients. 
And what I've been able to observe, in particular in children under 10 years of age, is that uh, when they fail and I do revision surgery, I find that the notch has closed. It is a peculiarity that I see, and I wonder if that could be part of a risk factor for re-rupture. But in, in summary, yes, I do take into account the size of the notch, and when it is necessary, I increase the size of the notch. It offers me a larger space, and it also contributes to the healing of the ligament that I am either repairing or reconstructing. Dr. Radici, I am also a fan of uh, the notch plasty because uh, aside from uh, providing better visualization uh, for uh, of the landmarks for the femoral tunnel it uh, corrects uh, factors uh, like in females with the inverted v and so impingement is more important usually in women. But the point is that if you try to do a repair when you do the notch plasty, you necessarily are going to injure the rest of the femoral stump. So it is not going to be very useful for a repair. So I have no experience uh, in uh, the operations that Dr. Martha Murray is doing, but uh, from the technical standpoint, I think it would be an issue to do the plasty trying to do a repair because you will necessarily damage the femoral stump as you do the plasty. Any technical details, Dr. Murray? Uh, sure, and, and I, I apologize for not including those on my initial answer. The notch plasty that we typically do for this is a kidney bean shaped notch plasty. So you certainly want to preserve the femoral stump, which is coming mostly from the back of the notch. And you just take the bone from the front and then down along the bottom of the condyle. So it's a kidney bean shaped notch plasty, not a traditional notch plasty that we would think of for an ACL reconstruction where you want to get down to bone. I completely agree with Dr. Radici that you want to preserve that femoral stump at all costs. So we are going to go on to another topic that you have included in your talk, Dr. Murray, which is the development of MRI and showing on T2 how the T2 efficiency has evolved to show the integrity of the ACL. This is a slide taken from one of your papers. It shows, however, that signals are different between the reconstructed graft and the repaired graft using the Bayer technique. And there is and there are differences in the fibers up to, up to two years. At present, we believe that MRI is not a predictor of ACL failure, and it is not yet an important factor for determining which is the right time for return to sports. Could you clarify a little bit more? Um, what patterns are you taking into account in terms of MRI reference to consider uh, to determine return to sports. And Dr. Radici also has studies with MRI and PRP. Are you also doing follow-up with MRI to determine whether the sports, uh, the athlete can go back to sports early or you're only going to take into consideration the clinical findings? Dr. Morey. Yes, no, I'm very familiar with Dr. Radici's work. It's excellent with his work on PRP and changing the ligamentization rate. Um, for the bare patients in this study, um, we did preclinical work most to get to this point. And we studied many different types of, of signal intensity on the MRI to try to determine which had the best predictive ability in the preclinical model, where we can do the MRI and do some calculations and then test the actual strength of the knee ligament. So we cannot do that in human patients. So the best we can do is do that in our pig and then see if those same signals that work in that porcine model will also work in humans. And in humans right now, we really only have indirect measures of the ligament's actual strength. So we really only have, did they fail? But we all know that failure can also be due to what sports they go back to or how many sports they do or how awkward they are. 
So it may not be solely related to the MRI signal. There may be other factors that explain who's going to repair. Um, and that's what makes this a very complicated problem. Uh, so this is something that we are working on. Um, we have, I'm not, I don't think it's going to be that it's simply the average signal in your ACL that tells the strength of it. I agree with you, Dr. Gravini. I think you are insinuating that it may be more the pattern of intensity that is more important, and I think that that is right. Unfortunately for us now, we only have about 150 patients that we have MRIs on from the Bayer procedure. And so I think we are going to need more patients to better understand what MR features are predictive of someone who is at risk. But I think that we should work all together to get there because having a similar, something similar to an x-ray for a fracture or an ACL either after a graft or a repair would be extremely useful for us and the patient. Dr. Radici. Dr. Radici, I fully agree with Dr. Murai. I think that MRI is an excellent tool to measure indirectly, though, the degree of uh, maturation or neo uh, ligament of the repaired ligament or of the graft over time. And uh, the correlation that we did uh, when uh, that the work was done where we had groups of patients whom we had operated on for the ACL and before a second look we would do an MRI and next day we would do the arthroscopic second look and make a biopsy at the three points that we can see there on the screen basal central and proximal and that correlation, histological correlation with the image then gives us a correlation of maturation. So I think it is a very good uh, tool to determine how mature or uh, strong is the repaired ligament uh, or the reconstructed ligament from the histological point of view. But that is not the sole factor that tells us when the patient is ready to return to sports because of, the biological factor, the, the ligament strength is important, but the, the ability to recover motor control, muscle strength, uh, gestures, sports gestures, and proprioception are as uh, important as the biological aspects, and they are causes of re rupture. So if we don't work on the recovery of strength, of the recovery of the Perception, etc. We are going to have a higher rate of re ruptures, regardless of whether the ligament has been adequately repaired and whether it has matured biologically or not. Remember that uh, the ligament was healthy when it was ruptured. So, in the context uh, of sports, it is different. Uh, returning to sports is different in the context of how the ligament response MRI is a very good tool. I'm going to take one of the questions from the chat and uh, relate it to the MRI. There are two questions having to do with the tension applied to the ligament in the bare repair. And what is the best suture that ought to be used as a scaffolding to uh, do the biological bridge in the bare repair? And uh, de depending on the tension or depending on the suture, how do the MRI images change, Dr. Murray? Okay, so first I just want to clarify, we have sutures that we use to provide mechanical support to the knee so that we have a suture that goes from an endo button on the femur, on the lateral side of the femur, down to a second endo button on the front of the tibia that can help to reduce the AP laxity in the early healing period. Those sutures are made of ethabond, for us because we wanted to choose a suture that would not be coated with any silicone or any of the high strength sutures that could cause again an immunogenic response in the knee. So Ethabond is very inert and we've always used that. Those sutures are used to bring the, to reduce that abnormal AP translation that occurs with an ACL tear to allow the ligament to heal in a more anatomic position. In our preclinical studies, we know that those sutures only last about four weeks before they break. 
but that appears to be long enough to kind of get that AP trans abnormal AP translation out of the way, and the bare repairs tend to heal at, the, at a similar length to the contralateral ACL. That's the suture that we use. However, I still feel strongly that using a suture alone, whatever the suture is, is not enough. It, you can't just restore the mechanics of the knee. That is fine for time zero, but if you want to have a good result months and years later, you need to restore the biology and you need to get biologic healing of the ACL. That will not occur reliably with the repair without some implant to fill the gap between the torn ligament ends. And that is why we also need an implant to go in between those torn ends. And that's what the bare implant has been developed to do. Let me check it out here. Thank you. This uh, work also led by you, Dr. Moraes, talks uh, about the predictors uh, of maximum failure and how there is different behavior in the reconstruction of the ACL or the repair with uh, bridge enhancement. And it shows different behavior at six and at 12 months in terms of the um, uh, collagen fib fibers and cellularity. Does, has that influenced uh, the rehabilitation pattern or the return to sports? And we include another question, which is the ideal moment of doing a bare type repair, acute, chronic, uh, for how long is something acute or chronic? And uh, has that shown to change the rate of ligament uh, uh, healing? These are excellent questions. I'll take the second one first. So we think that the optimum time to repair the ACL is as soon as possible. So we did a study in pigs where we took the ACL and we cut one side, and then we waited either two weeks or six weeks and took the animal back to the operating room and then either repaired the ACL that had been ruptured two weeks earlier uh, we repaired that side, and then on the other side, we cut the second ACL and did an immediate repair. We did that at two weeks, and then another group at six weeks, and then we looked at the mechanical properties six, uh, so, excuse me, 12 weeks later. So what we found there was that the ligaments that were repaired immediately had a much higher strength than those that were repaired with a delay. Now, whether that same thing will happen in humans, we don't know. But that is why in the BEAR1 and BEAR2 trials, we tried to repair ligaments that were reasonably close to the date of their injury. When we have looked in the patients with BEAR so far at the time points between one and six weeks out from injury, we have not seen an increased failure rate or a change in the MRI uh, scores um, based on the time within that time frame but we probably do not have enough patience yet to really understand where is the optimal cutoff for time. But right now it appears that within the first six weeks seems to be reasonably good. Um, and then your first question about the histologic marker. So what we found, this was another preclinical study in pigs. And what we found there was that for repaired ligaments, if they had good cellular structure at six months, they actually had the best mechanical strength. So that means that they had cells that looked like the right type of cells, that they had, uh, that they were aligned, and the collagen structure didn't matter so much. So it could still be that it was scarred in and the, the collagen wasn't super organized, but if you had cells there early, they did well. And then at a year out, if the collagen was organized at a year, those were also the ones that did well. So it was a little bit different than what we saw in the graph, which in the graphs at six months, if the collagen was still organized, it hadn't been beat up, if the collagen still looked good, those were the graphs that were performing the best. And then the graphs that had a normal ACL cellularity by a year were also the ones that did best. So if they kept their collagen structure from the graph, but then it got recellularized by a year, those were the graphs that tended to do the best. So that's what we found in this study. Again, a preclinical model, not in humans. Giovanni, I wanted to go back to the topic of maturation of the ligament and what Dr. Murray has just said and what Dr. Radici has said. It's important to understand that different groups in the literature have shown that the maturation of the ligament 
uh, happens even out to two years after reconstruction. That is what is suggested uh, by the MRI and by the biopsies as well. And I think that uh, that has to be taken into account for return to sports, added obviously to what Fernando has said which is also a determinant factor, the proprioception, etc., uh, which recovers better to the extent that biologically the ligament is more mature. So that is important. I've been discussing this for a long time. We have focused too much on the surgical technique, on the material that we're going to use, and we have not really solved the risk of re-rupture. And that re-rupture risk is directly associated with the timing of uh, return to sports activity. I tend increasingly to think and to recommend that the patient should not return to sport before two years. And during that time, uh, a lot of work must be done on proprioception, strength, uh, uh, because uh, the mere fact that the knee, that the health and knee ruptures within the next year, the ligament ruptures within the next year when the patient is not well rehabilitated. So yes, that's something to consider. So I wanted to insist on that. And regarding the type of suture, it has also been found that the tension of the ligament and the location of it, whether if it, it is done through a monotunnel or the anteromedial approach, you can see that the maturation is different uh, according to the different studies, and that's why you need to wait a little bit more until the ligament acquires biological and tension characteristics that are sufficient, and that does not happen before two years. Thank you, Dr. Zapata. Later on, we are going to go back to this topic of return to sports and rehabilitation, which is key in our discussions. There is a, a critical topic, and it is the use of PRP and orthobiologics. There are questions about this, but there are two interesting studies that you have made, Dr. Murray, regarding um, the use of PRP, in, which increases uh, collagen metabolism and expression in the ACL and would appear to be favorable. And later on, there is another study by yourself as well that says that PRP does not contribute much in terms of uh, uh, bear type repair. So we are somewhat confused. Uh, so should we use it? Is it worth it? Is it not? And Dr. Radici also has a lot of experience with PRP. And I would like to know what has been his uh, experience. And uh, the chat uh, also has a question about uh, stem cells in the type, not of repairs, not repair, not with bear, but in acute repairs associated with stem cells. Uh, Dr. Leal could also talk to us about it. Uh, so Dr. Murray, uh, could you please talk first? Yes, yeah, so we spent a lot of time and money, uh, fortunately it was mostly other people's money, on figuring out what PRP formulation would be best for the ACL. And we tried to study this somewhat systematically in an animal model for ACL grafts. And we looked at using whole blood uh, or 3X uh, or PRP that was made with three times the normal amount of platelets or PRP that was made with five times the amount of platelets to look and see could we enhance the graft feeling by using those types of cellular components in addition to an extracellular matrix scaffold wrapped around the graft. And what we found in, cre in, in every way that we studied this really was that use of platelets is very helpful. But use of other things in blood is also helpful. So, for example, red blood cells, which we take out when we made the PRP, actually help in vitro with getting ACL cells to make collagen. And that's obviously something we want them to do if we want them to make a scar and to heal in this ACL. So, basically, after a lot of different work, we came to the conclusion that for our, in our hands, getting the ACL to heal works best when we use whole blood. We need the platelets, but what we need is all of the cells that are in whole blood to best stimulate the healing. Similar to the way that whole blood stimulates healing of the MCL. And what was missing in the ACL 
was a carrier to hold that blood in between the torn ends of the ACL, so it couldn't get washed away prematurely or dissolved by the enzymes in the post-traumatic synovial fluid. But in our hands, I, I, I am a strong believer in the biology of blood cells. Um, but for our, for our procedures, whole blood always works best. Dr. Radici. Interesting what you're saying, Dr. Murray, because one would think that if you supply more growth factors which are associated with healing, um, it should to have a better effect at the concentration than a more diluted blood, but that has a lot to do with the way you're doing your work. The use of platelets, it's controversial because it depends a lot on the type of platelet concentrate that is used, how it is applied, the timing when it is placed, and that causes changes also in the assessment if you do if you apply biological factors, you need to have a measurement uh, and uh, of the of each biological factor in its clinical result. So as Dr. Murray is doing, in if in the animals histologically there is a real change with the supply of these biological tissues, but the studies that are seen in humans uh, where we cannot do uh, sacrifice biopsies are indirect. So we're just uh, determining whether it matures faster or slower based on MRI, whether the healing is better or worse uh, based on the acute uh, imaging. But there is no comparison of biological results uh, or a relationship uh, with more or less pain and returning sooner or later to sports. And uh, it's interesting to ask Dr. Murray in this uh, biological process, which as Dr. Zapata is saying, is a, pro a process that requires months, regardless of this uh, bridge enhancement is there or not. What is the protocol, Dr. Murray, that you use in your team in uh, patients after surgery, do you immobilize them to protect the suture? When do you start uh, rehabilitation? What type of rehabilitation? And uh, from, pra from the practical standpoint, the, practically, the patient who undergoes bare, in practical terms, when is that patient in a condition to do uh, some activity and then go back to sports? Yeah, but let me, Joanne, before we hand over to Dr. Murai to finish the topic about biologics, I think uh, the biological topic is the one that has been most striking about Dr. Murai's work because um, go, thinking that uh, in a scaffold like this one, we can have good healing only with peripheral blood is uh, to go back to Scott Rodeo 20 years ago when he started to do these things and all the evolution of concentrating. The two key concepts there, in my opinion, are that the mechanical language for this biology is what predominates and the bridge that is being created of leaving the stumps and doing a technique where the cells can really come together and create a bridge is key. Uh, biological augmentation uh, what has been determined in Dr. Murray's own studies is that you need to have a blood and hardly nothing else. The cells themselves will find their way. There is no biologic logic in thinking that it is worse to use just blood. It should be better because there because with PRP there is uh, alpha granules, but in this case, what we need most is the bridging more than the biological aspect. So as we were discussing with Fernando some days ago in another webinar, um, the trend to use PRP in immediate surgery with all the inflammatory elements that are present there will probably not work. As while it could work used mixed after six weeks, 
it, it could work even better. So I don't know what Martha thinks about two things which are very popular, and that is the question to finish up with the biological topic. Do you think that placing injections inside the knee without bridges could work for the healing of the ACL? Is that something that you think could happen? Because if it were just the, the element that, that biologically creates the bridge and the stumps would uh, try to find themselves, it could work. But what we see from the studies is that what works is the bridge. But the question is, uh, will just a single injection without the bridge work? What do you think? So then somehow you have to reestablish a, a scaffolding between the torn ends of the ligament. So you have two choices. You can either implant something that will hold your biologic locally where you want it, or you have to fill up the whole joint somehow with the scaffold of your biologic. So we always kind of thought that putting the bridge where you want it to encourage the healing only where you want it would be more effective than injecting something that could cause healing everywhere. Because if we get healing everywhere in the joint, kind of indiscriminately, yeah. that to us, we were worried about arthrofibrosis there and stiffening of the joint. And the only thing that patients hate worse than a knee that's a little unstable is a knee that doesn't move. So um, we have stayed away from trying to just inject something that would affect the whole joint and have tried instead to affect that area between the torn ends of the ligament. There is, a, an, there is an additional thing, and I agree with Carlos, that there are many factors that come together to get the mechanical and the biological part to work. I don't use PRP. I use blood. I do augmentations. But the time of the repair of a tissue depends on the time since the injury. And that is why it is key that the repair surgery to be attempted within the first few weeks after the injury. I try to do it within the first month. And in those cases, I, when necessary, I use not what the Dr. Murray is uh, doing. I use a hamstring, hamstring similar to what uh, Fernando Radice showed. And I feel that the biology of that moment of the lesion of the injury contributes far more to the healing and to a biological process that is closer to normal. Yeah, yeah, Giovanni, we have a couple of minutes. We have gone over our time, but this discussion is very pleasant. I don't know, uh, Martha, uh, do you want to leave or what? <laughs> okay. I'm fine. How do you manage? Okay, great, Dr. Murray. They, they are worried because we have gone over time. So the key question is how do you manage the post-operative period? And also another key question, how do you, yeah, how do you manage the post-operative period? How much does the post-operative period change when you do a reconstruction as compared to the bare process? And how do you see it in terms of differences between teenagers and adults? All excellent questions. So in BEAR 2, we actually did the same rehabilitation protocol for the BEAR patients and the reconstructed patients. Because, and the patients and the physical therapists were all blinded as to the treatment group each patient was in. The rehabilitation protocol for both groups had them locked in extension in the knee brace overnight until the morning, and then they could unlock but they could only go from zero to 50 degrees of flexion for the first two weeks. Uh, and then they could gradually open up the brace uh, over the first six weeks, but they could not go past 90 degrees for the first six weeks. They were partial weight bearing for four weeks and then allowed to wean off their crutches as they could tolerate. From that standpoint, they then followed a protocol very similar to that used in the moon, the moon group. Um, so it's a goal-based protocol, if they achieved certain goals of range of motion or ability to do certain things, they would move to the next phase of the rehabilitation protocol. When we brought the patients back at six months um, in the BEAR2 trial, they had functional testing. Uh, and if they passed their functional testing, which consisted of a high score on the IKDC, uh, IKDC patient-reported outcome, as well as hop testing, then they were allowed to return to sport. 
the BEAR subjects really had very little difficulty with passing the hop testing, which caught us a little bit off guard because typically in our practice, the reconstructed patients would come back at six months and they would pretty much uniformly fail the hop testing. And we would say, oh, that's too bad. You've got to go back and do more work, come back in another six weeks. And that way we could kind of stretch out the return to play until nine months. But we did not have that same excuse for many of the bear patients. Um, and so we needed to figure out how to slow them down a little bit more. Um, and in bear three, we actually changed to return to sport at nine months to be more consistent in, in all patients, uh, to be more consistent with what is currently done for reconstruction. A very small thing, Giovanni. I see, Martha, that the patient's perception is very good. They feel that they've been given something very good. But then what is the perception of the surgeons who have trained to do this? Is it easy for them to understand the surgery? Is it technically challenging to place in that uh, plug? Is, uh, is it a difficult learning curve to get the colleagues to accept this procedure? Um, the surgeons actually enjoy doing it. I think it's fun for them. Um, so they have, we started off putting the whip stitch in the tibial stump with a mini arthrotomy. We need a mini arthrotomy, it's about two inches long along the medial border of the tendon to deliver the scaffold. So when we started doing these, the surgeons would do their whip stitch through the arthrotomy. And then they quickly found arthroscopic tools that they wanted to put the whip stitch in with arthroscopic technique and they've enjoyed doing that. Um, so I think while it's different than ACL reconstruction, many of the maneuvers are the same as they are for reconstruction, just with a smaller drill to put in a cinch um, and delivering the scaffold. So I think they have enjoyed it. They've always asked, can we get more scaffolds? We actually ran out of scaffolds so, or implants, so we're waiting to get more so they can do more. Um, but I think that the surgeons find it actually fairly fun. They, there is a learning curve. Um, the first cases usually take about an hour and a half to do, but within a few cases, typically the times are down to under an hour. And I would expect that as the surgical teams learn more about how to do the procedure and the flow of it, that it will be shorter than that. Um, but I think the surgeons have enjoyed doing it. Okay. Well then. Giovanni. Giovanni, there is a question in the chat which I think is interesting for Dr. Murray and for all the panelists. What is the influence of the amount of revenant, either the femoral or the tibial, in the final result? What has been your experience, Dr. Murray? Well, we, we thought that the longer the tibial remnant, the better the results would be. But it actually turned out that the longer the femoral stump was, which we don't put stitches in at all, but the longer the femoral stump was, the better the MRI at six months was. So we are not sure what effect the remnant size or the remnant shape has on outcomes. Um, my guess is that we just do not have enough patience yet to really understand that, and that we also probably do not have a, an exact enough classification scheme for the remnant itself. Um, so those are two things that we would like to work on in the future studies. Giovanni, oh. is there some space to use the bare system in revision surgeries? Do you think it could work at some point in ACL revision surgery? I think it would be hard um, because you, I think part of the reason that bear works so well is that you actually have the neurovascular structures in the ACL that are still present. And I think they help guide healing. My concern with revision would be that you have likely removed a large part of those um, sure. structures when you have drilled the tunnels to place your graft. So I'm not certain that the bear would work in a revision setting. Um, Dr. Radici showed some beautiful videos of saving the remnant and putting a hamstring graft through the middle. I mean, perhaps someday in those cases, if you had a living stump anyway, after the repair, maybe it would work there. But I think that's many years in the future before we're brave enough to try that. I agree. Yes, I agree. Okay. 
joy. Let's move uh, so that we can reach the topics of rehabilitation, which are interesting. Age, the age at which uh, the injury of the ACL happens is also a factor to determine what technique we use. Dr. Radici showed that they use tunnel, but there the tanner, but uh, there are studies that show that uh, validity, uh, or there is a lot of variability among surgeons to determine uh, the age at which you offer a bridge. I use uh, uh, the Maglio technique uh, in terms to determine the growth age, and that uh, could uh, play a role in growth plate lesions. Uh, you showed that the median was at around 17 years, and one would think that uh, the repair bear group would have uh, would have more affinity and with smaller tunnels you could have less risk of growth plate damage and the changes in the mechanical properties of the biology in younger ages is there there are no differences between males and females in the prepuber age uh, afterwards uh, it changes uh, there are different uh, laxity and hormonal factors um, and uh, different uh, influencing factors. So summarizing, do you uh, take any measurement, do you make any measurement apart from the tanner to determine how much more growth uh, uh, is expected and use extra articular techniques the younger the patient or could there be an interesting solution as they are younger and as they are older should we go more for reconstruction than bears or if there's an acute injury of the ACL and we have a good stump would we, we would prepare to do a bear more than an acute augmentation what are your options Dr. Zapata, Dr. Radici, Dr. Murray? Who wants to start, Dr. Zapata? I want to be clear that I, like you, use the lateral X-ray, but the truth is that I insist in the concept that the problem is not the surgical technique whether it is epiphyseal, transepiphyseal, extra-articular. All the meta-analysis studies that have been made and published over the past 10 years show that they have been, there aren't big differences in terms of stability results and re-rupture regardless of the technique and in terms of complications either, which is very important to consider. I agree with Dr. Radici in the sense that Arnowski a long time ago solved the issue of what happens when you do a facile tunnel of less than three or four percent of the total growth plate area and you interpose soft tissue which is what you basically do when you do a reconstruction and along those lines I use and the technique at the institution is to make uh, uh, tunnels that go through the physis and we do metaphyseal anchors and uh, we use hamstrings we don't use bone and we do metaphyseal anchoring and uh, usually then what I use is a preoperative uh, uh, standing x-ray of the lower limbs uh, to have an exact definition of the angle of the knee and the length of the limb in order to uh, follow it and one year and later and two years later I take another standing x-ray and what I've seen is less than two percent uh, angular complications and discrepancy complications uh, and that is my main parameter but age doesn't worry me too much I agree with you that the tanner by itself doesn't work very well and if you want it uh, if you want it uh, something you could combine combine things but they are not necessarily more accurate so after 10 or 12 years 
I make tunnels through the growth plate and underneath uh, that age, I do a technique very similar to that of Dr. Michele in younger patients, although there are publications like this one uh, with more immature patients when the epiphyseal nucleus is smaller, there is a, there is a lower risk. Dr. Radici? I agree with Dr. Zapata, the surgical technique. Uh, we do the transfacial regardless of age, but it's important to know that the younger the patient or the smaller the patient, the younger the patient in terms of age, the higher the risk of complications and statistics are clear in that regard when you review the data you find that it is not just uh, operating but th that there is a higher risk the technique shown to us by dr murray is very attractive uh, especially for uh, the potential that these patients have during their growth uh, stage it's a patient between 11 and 14 years of age the possibility of making these bridges uh, and allowing these patients to have uh, good healing and recovery of the ligament uh, uh, from a biological standpoint uh, gives us uh, more functional advantages for the future of the children. They could have uh, re-ruptures, uh, but uh, they wouldn't per perhaps require revisions. But but the, the, the thing is that in Dr. Murray's uh, studies, there aren't any patients under 18. They are all over 18. So we would need to think how these techniques work in children. And it could be a good option to do it facile and not transfacile. And uh, that would avoid the growth plate uh, damage. And uh, there wouldn't be a risk of over tightening the repaired structure and would uh, provide uh, a biological contribution to the ligament with a higher potential and a faster potential to heal than in an individual of 18 or 20 years of age. It's a good challenge. Uh, maybe Dr. Murray and her team could start uh, studying that uh, younger population more than the adults because uh, the technique could uh, could pay off very well. Dr. Murray. Yes, we would certainly like that. And we have um, recently gotten approval to do a study that drops the age down to 12. So the BEAR-2 trial had patients as young as 14, um, but this BEAR-3 trial will have patients as young as 12 allowed and skeletally immature patients as well. So we certainly don't know how those patients <clears throat> will respond, but I agree with you that, especially in groups that are at a high risk of failure, or a retear, doing something that doesn't make tunnels that you have to avoid on the revision, doesn't make a revision complicated as their first procedure, might be beneficial to both the patient and the surgeon. Um, at Children's, we live in the house of Dr. McKaylee, so patients who have um, uh, open, uh, much growth remaining get his McKaylee procedure. Um, that's typically boys who are under 14 and girls who are under 12. We would consider that. We check a bone age to make sure the bone age is consistent. Um, for those of you that don't have a bone age book, the main cutoff for us is on an AP view of the left hand. If the sesamoid bone at the base of the thumb is present, then we feel pretty comfortable doing a transficeal hamstring reconstruction, keeping the hardware away from the physis. If that sesamoid isn't present, that's when we would typically consider doing an extra physial procedure like the IT band reconstruction popularized by Dr. McKay. This is another point for debate, the role of associated extra-articular reconstructions in children. The anatomy varies. The anterolateral uh, or the anterolateral structures uh, and the attachment, points of attachment of insertion vary a lot, but there are studies that show that extra-articular reinforcements could be beneficial. Have you considered, Dr. Murray, uh, the bare technique in patients who, or add an extra-articular reconstruction uh, in cases of uh, LCA injury adding extra articular reconstructions uh, to the usual reconstruction of the LCA. And in your case, Dr. Murray added to the bare procedure. Dr. Murray, could you come closer to the microphone, please? Because I'm losing you at times. So that's an excellent question. Um, and I think that's a matter that's still of 
great debate even in the adult reconstruction literature. So Alan Getgood and the stability study, you know, showed that if you do an extraarticular LEC um, addition to your ACL, you can in, in high risk patients, you can de risk de you can decrease your risk of graft re rupture. Um, but we also know that changing the anatomy in that way and adding additional constraints is going to increase the risk of developing lateral compartment arthritis. And a nice study published in AJSM by Dr. Servian and her group from Lyon demonstrated the three times risk of spreading arthritis from 20% to 50% in that lateral compartment. So changing the anatomy uh, may make us feel better, but I'm not confident that it makes the patient better in the long run. So I think Again, we need to define what the outcomes are with these different procedures, and then we can offer the patients the best information so they can choose uh, whether they want a decreased risk of graft rupture versus uh, less chance of osteoarthritis. Because I feel that different patients will make different decisions. So the best thing we can do is offer them information so they can make the decision on what's most important to them. Dr. Radici, Dr. Zapata. Dr. Radici, Dr. Zapata. I've had uh, some experience in adding to the reconstruction procedure for the ligament uh, an extra articular procedure, the reconstruction of the anterolateral ligament. Based on what? On a, a more biomechanical analysis when the knee sustains an ACL injury and there is a biomechanical alteration of the functionality of the knee. There is a deficit of the extension. This is a problem of rotational control, uh, external internal rotation. And one of the muscles that is very important, the uh, agonist to the ACL, and which controls internal rotation uh, on 90 degrees, uh, is a hamstring, is a semitendinous. When we use a semitendinous in the reconstruction of the ACL in children, we are weakening that rotational control between 90 and more degrees, and we are adding a strength deficit at around 110 degrees of flexion and in muscle power. So by taking the craft, we create a deficit associated to the biomechanics of the knee. And if to that, we add factors that come with the patient and which we cannot modify, like hyperlaxity and recurvatum, uh, valgus, especially in women, or a tibial, an increased tibial slope, rotational control is going to be far more difficult to achieve with the reconstruction of the ACL. So if we add control, rotation control, we give a better possibility uh, to that knee and reduce the risk of re-rupture. That is the concept. It's not just that you do it for the sake of doing it. Okay, Giovanni, one last question so that we can close because it is late. We have to go and uh, see our children. <laughs> last question. This is the guideline uh, used at the Boston Children's Hospital for recovery after an ACL. And we see here quadriceps and hamstring strength, early returning to sport, and strategies to say that a patient can return. Do you follow these strategies that show that if you don't fulfill them, there is a higher risk? If there is no, if there are big differences between the quadriceps and the hamstrings, there is a risk of re rupture up to 10 times and a very early return to sports and having these ranges of mobility. Do you have a program of prevention in particular in children who are soccer players? It has, has this shown that these prevention programs reduce the risk? Um, do you consider these patterns in the patients who, whom you operated with there and the patients uh, uh, taken to traditional reconstruction, Dr. Murray? I think that there is some uh, evidence that in patients who have not yet torn an ACL, that optimizing their strength and flexibility through many of these types of programs and emphasizing to them, to them uh, correct body patterning for different maneuvers has been effective in reducing ACL tear risk. 
The issue is whether similar types of programs can prevent a second ACL injury after an ACL reconstruction. And although lots of people have worked on that question, I don't think that that is still very clear. There may be some reduced risk of an ipsilateral tear, but patients who pass these tests are also at an increased risk for a contralateral ACL tear. So their overall rate of a secondary ACL injury is about the same whether they pass these criteria or not. So it's difficult. I think return to sport is a very difficult question. I agree with Dr. Zapata that the longer that you can keep them out, the better. Um, I don't know about children in South America, but in the United States, I can tell them not to go back, but when they feel good, they're back. So I don't, you know, we have found some efficacy in using a functional ACL brace in this high risk population for return to sport for the first two years. Um, but other than that, if people have other ideas on how to keep these kids from playing sports, let me know because I would love to know what they are. Dr. Radici. Dr. Radici, it's an excellent question. Uh, in a webinar which we had, uh, I showed three populations of our cases. One, the professional uh, soccer players, high performance. Others, uh, high perm performance uh, athletes in the Olympic uh, group. A third group of the amateur athletes and the differences for return to sports were significantly different between the professional sports athletes who return to 100% versus the amateur who go back to 65% and re-ruptures increase proportionally going from the professionals to the amateurs. So what I was trying to demonstrate why these ex uh, differences existed if the surgical team and the programs of rehabilitation were similar. And the difference uh, has to do with the uh, rehabilitation phases and return to sports from the point of view of meeting goals. So it's very important for us to forget that, that concept that, that the Time is the only thing that will tell us when the patient is ready to go back to sports. We usually say, oh, you are out seven, six months, you're ready, go back. And we don't look at the other parameters, which are so important. And when we meet those patterns, we comply with them, like in professional soccer, who work with a multidisciplinary team that are with the athletes from the very first day with them who have all the conditions. We have uh, an average of return of 7.5 months. Uh, imagine in a normal population, children who don't comply with the uh, program or adults that um, don't complete the goals, uh, the process, they are not ready. So if we tell them go back to sports uh, and somebody would, would take those patients and reassess their biomechanics uh, and their functionality, they would realize that they would be 30 or 40 percent under the parameters that would be needed to practice sports. So return to sports uh, depends a lot on our ability to be very stringent in getting them to comply goals. Uh, it's not that it's because a child that I need to wait uh, two or three years before going to sports. If there is no, during that uh, three year period, if there is no recovery of the mechanical functioning, they are going to go back to sports and re-injure themselves. So more than time then is to meet the goals. And that's difficult to accomplish in children and uh, more difficult the younger they are. And the use of braces, we find we can use them in non-contact sports uh, like um, motorcycling, tennis, ski, but in contact sports uh, like rugby or soccer, football, it's impossible. It's a risk for the other players uh, who are on the field uh, in the opposite team, uh, a clash uh, with a knee that is in a brace. So we cannot protect these uh, children who have been operated of the ACL who have, want to go back to rugby or to football with a brace. Uh, and, they, and those that are for soft tissues don't provide sufficient uh, protection. So it's an important big problem and we are trying to think how to do it. So, but, but the message is don't talk too much about time, but rather about goals. Dr. Zapata, I agree in the sense that uh, 
there are many things that need to be considered for return. I think that return to sports is a question that has not been solved in the repair or reconstruction of the ACL. There is a summation there. Time and uh, undoubtedly meeting the goals, the physical goals. When I say that I'd rather wait two years instead of one, I'm not saying two years just sitting around, but two years absent from competition, but working on strength, proprioception, jumps, geometry, uh, um, but not in competition. That's what I don't want them to do, not go back to competition. M most of my patients are under 16 years of age, so they are not yet professional athletes. I have some in the junior leagues between 14 and 16 years of age, and I have managed to get them to wait at least one year. I agree that it should be goal-based and for the longest uh, time possible, and I hardly ever use a brace. Well, I wish to thank all the panelists. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Leal to say goodbye, but our special gratitude to Dr. Murray for her presentation, for all her answers to Dr. Radici for his experience, the same thing to Dr. Zapata. Uh, very grateful to all of you for your teaching. Well, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure, really. We could spend another two hours here, but uh, um, uh, we need to continue. A special gratitude to all the participants, then Nacho, Giovanni, and in particular to our good friend, Fernando, who always provides us with very clear concepts. Martha Moray, thank you very much for having joined us. It was such a pleasure, such an honor to have uh, been together at this webinar. Our gratitude also to Adriana, who must be exhausted <laughs> and uh, must uh, be dreaming with a glass of wine or a Coke. Uh, she did very well. All the participants who joined us uh, and may this happen again. Thank you very much on behalf of the Colombian Society of Orthopedic Surgery and our Colombian Society of Arthroscopy and Sports Medicine. And uh, thank you very much. Hope to see you. Thank you very much to all. Bye-bye. Cheerio. Martha, before, uh, before we leave, I just want to uh, go in, in, in English here for you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Really, uh, it was really amazing. Uh, you you learn from this a lot. You learn that there's a lot of things uh, coming in. Uh, you see how thankful we are for your work and uh, how we appreciate the the way that you're uh, moving a big university and a great group of sports medicine and pediatric orthopedics and sports uh, towards the benefit of all our patients in the world. So uh, be be very sure that we're learning a lot from you and this is the right way to go. Thanks a lot. I, Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the time. I wish. I mean, I'm I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you sometime over there and have a a little something in, in the north end and the uh, I don't know the daily catch with a little wine. Okay, so we'll, we'll see you there. Great. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for everything and uh, bye bye and say hi to everyone in my beloved mm -hmm. city of Boston. Marta, the yes. promoter. Thank you very much for your confidence and. If you like to do your device in uh, our country, we are available. Oh, yeah. Sounds great. You're ready. No, we're you trying, bring we're some. To get manufacturing up and running now, so hopefully very, we can very good that. work about that. Great. Thank We're you. ready to start. We got like okay. 10 yeah. countries well, that means to do our multi, get, yeah, multinational Yeah, do I get to come down and teach you then? That would be fun. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a must. Okay. Colombia okay. and Chile together. Perfect. Yep. We'll see you then. Thanks a lot. Okay, so good night. Thank you, Adriana, very it, much. It has been a really good pleasure. Good. Bye-bye. Thank good you. Gracias, Adriana. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Adriana.